Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be unto you. I welcome you all today for a very special event. And it pains me that we have to have this event on such beautiful weather after so many weeks of cold and even yesterday flurries of snow, a day that we should have been outside frolicking with joy. We are now here listening to an academic talk. But nonetheless, what needs to be done needs to be done. And as I was preparing uh, this lecture, uh, it, it was daunting uh, to say the least because there's so much to say. And the message that I want to give today is a message that certain segments of Islam and certain segments of mainstream America find unpalatable. Because it is a message that is critical at once of certain elements of the Muslim understanding of Islam and also of certain actions and policies that we have undertaken. And so by the end of this lecture you will understand why someone like myself is getting attacked from both opposites. We have members of the far right and we have members of Islamic radicals both basically attacking me. And you'll kind of understand why and to make it all possible I have to summarize my views and stances in around half an hour so here goes today's talk is going to revolve around three broad topics firstly the rise of ISIS and what ISIS is and is ISIS even Islamic or not how do we view this as Muslims secondly some context as to why and how ISIS came about and thirdly some personal reflections and comments and on what we can do uh, what should be done to uh, battle uh, ISIS. So to answer the first question, ISIS is a extremist rebel group that now controls large swaths of Iraq and Syria. It is officially an offshoot of Al-Qaeda. It actually was called the Al-Qaeda of Iraq, AQI. And it broke off in around 2008-2009 because of theological and methodological differences. And although still the actual place and the leaders behind it remain murky and hide behind nom de guerres, it really does appear that its, its military operations seem to date back from around uh, 2008. And it has achieved, purely from a political standpoint, phenomenal success. Particularly when it captured the Iraqi city of Mosul, which is one of the largest cities of the region. In fact, it's a similar size city to Memphis. So imagine a radical fringe movement conquering a city uh, like like Memphis. And this actually gave it impetus, the bravado, to announce a worldwide global caliphate last year, less than a year ago, in June of 2014. And all analysts who talk about ISIS, all political scientists, they're surprised and shocked at how successful ISIS has been, again, purely from a political standpoint. In a very short period of time, they have, for all intents and purposes, carved out a new political entity. They have functioning government bodies. They're paying their employees relatively good salaries for the region. They're running court systems that resolve disputes even between members of the broader public. And there are many other tangible forms of government. In fact, even it is alleged they've issued their own currency. Now, this is a version of a terrorist organization that we have not seen before. An organization that has achieved a modicum of political success and independence. No other terrorist organization has really achieved this level of political success and independence, albeit its success is one that is hampered by a number of things. Most prominently, of course, is its sheer brutality. It's sheer brutality. I do not need to list for you in this room the gruesome realities of this organization. From its taped and broadcast beheadings, to its reintroduction of slavery, to its treatment of women, to its treatment of all those who disagree with it, to its expelling and massacring of many minority populations, such as the Yazidis of Iraq. And the Yazidis of Iraq were a, 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 a uh, Gnostic, type of group with an Islamic ethos and they had been living in Iraq for around seven, eight hundred years and uh, ISIS viewed them as simply being outside the fold of, of even human to be honest and tried to or attempted to massacre them and so on and so forth. And the Muslims around the world have continued to criticize ISIS and dissociate from its tactics. The fact of the matter is that there is hardly any acceptability of ISIS in mainstream Islam. The grand 
grand muftis of every single country have publicly condemned ISIS. Perhaps the most significant response was a very public letter to the this self-professed caliph, which was called a letter to al-Baghdadi, because this self-professed caliph calls himself Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. And in fact, there's a website online that's called a letter to al-Baghdadi.com. Literally, www a letter to al-Baghdadi.com. And this letter was a detailed refutation, point by point, using legal juristic terminology about the theology and about the methodology of ISIS. And it was signed by over 120 of the foremost clerics across the entire globe. And there were a handful of American clerics as well who were asked to sign. And I was honored to be uh, of the signatories of that document. And my name is still on that uh, document. And this letter, and it is translated into English, and of course it's written in Arabic, it's translated into English and Farsi and so many other uh, languages. Uh, this letter is an extremely technical letter written within the framework of Islamic jurisprudence and challenging ISIS's interpretation of jihad, ISIS's interpretation of killing innocent people, uh, their treatment of minorities, uh, and a host of other factors. And truth be told, people say, you know, why don't Muslims criticize ISIS? Why don't Muslims speak out against ISIS? The fact of the matter is that the Muslim world, by and large, has been screaming and shouting its dissociation from ISIS. All you need to do is walk into any Islamic center anywhere and ask anybody. There is zero support for this organization, really, by and large, across the uh, globe. And the history of our tradition is enough of, indi of an indication of the aberration of this entity. Never in our 14 centuries have we had had a caliphate with the type of barbarity, the type of viciousness that we see in ISIS. A simple reality check. This movement or this group known as the Yazidis, they lived in Iraq for 800 years. And Iraq is a Muslim civilization. And the capital of the Abbasid Caliphate for 550 years was in Iraq. Nobody treated the Yazidis like this until the rise of ISIS. Yazidis have always lived amongst the broader Muslim population. And the very fact that they're being expelled for the first time, and their lives are being threatened for the first time, indicates that these types of understandings truly are an aberration from mainstream Islam. And therefore, is ISIS Islamic? Well, it depends on what you mean. And there was a huge issue and debate. Uh, a very famous article came out in the Atlantic of the last month uh, called uh, uh, What ISIS Really Wants. And it was written by Graham Wood. And this article uh, claims that ISIS is very Islamic. And this article actually became the most read article ever in the history of the Atlantic. That's saying something. The Atlantic has been published for over 130 years, I think. I myself am a subscriber as well, by the regular subscriber. And the most read article ever in the history of Atlantic was this article. This article generated a huge controversy, especially from many academics and American Muslims who strongly disagreed with some of the premises of this article. And I was interviewed along with Graham uh, Wood on NPR, and you will find it as well uh, on my Facebook and Twitter, that we had a very interesting background and forth, uh, and it was, was on, on, on NPR. And you can listen to that where I pointed out what I believe were inconsistencies and incorrect uh, assumptions that he made. But the point being, one of his claims was, that ISIS is Islamic because they claim to be Islamic, because they're acting in the name of Islam. And my challenge to that was, well, in that case, Maybe from your perspective as a person outside the faith traditions, all claims to Islam are equally legitimate. But give us the right as Muslims and as Muslim theologians and as Muslim preachers and clerics to decide for ourselves what is truly Islamic and what is un-Islamic. Because the article actually attempted to say anybody who says ISIS is not Islamic is whitewashing uh, uh, the religion of Islam. They have no right to speak this way. And I said, how fair is it to equate, let's say, any terrorist organization from the Christian religion, from the Christian faith tradition, or from the Jew 
Jewish faith tradition, to extrapolate all of it and to claim that was also Christian or Jewish. And I gave you the example of one such organization, and that is the IRA. Uh, and the IRA, of course, uh, is well known. It was a, a Catholic uh, resistance movement, if you like, or organization that had its grievances against England. And it was definitely from within the Catholic paradigm. And they were very anti-Protestant. Much of the language they used was anti-Protestant. And they adopted this sectarian divide to further their political grievances. One of my main criticisms was, imagine writing an article about how Catholic the IRA was, ignoring everything about the political grievances and differences that the Irish had with the broader British uh, public, and only emphasizing the Catholic nature of the IRA. Imagine saying the IRA is Catholic, very Catholic, which is what Graham Wood said about the ISIS. ISIS is Islamic, very, very Islamic. Well, so is the IRA. But the grievances of the IRA, the, the, the reason why the IRA exists has nothing to do with Catholicism. There are issues that transcend theology, but these are religious people, and they're viewing what's happening in a religious light. The same analogy also applies to ISIS. Is ISIS Islamic? Frankly, as an academic, I say if you're speaking from a purely academic standpoint, yes, because they're coming from the Islamic tradition. But as an American Muslim, as a theologian, as a jurist, I say no, ISIS is not embodying the values of Islam. So is ISIS Islamic? Are you looking at Islamic as a noun or an adjective? If you're looking at it as a noun, yes, these are Muslims, they're claiming to act in the name of Islam. If you're looking at it as an adjective, are they embodying what mainstream Muslims around the globe view as being Islamic? Then the answer is a resounding no. And all you need to do is to look at the numbers. The caliph, the so-called caliph, has made a global announcement that all Muslims around the world should join his movement. Everybody should come and migrate to his lands and swear to him the oath of allegiance and fealty. Okay, so there's around 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. And technically Islam has not had a caliphate since the early part of the last century, 1927 was when the caliphate was abolished. So Muslims have not had a caliph for almost 100 years. Now we have this, this pretender to the throne. He is saying he's the caliph. He's issuing a global call. Is ISIS Islamic? Let's see how many Muslims responded. Highest estimates, around 20,000 fighters from around the world have answered the call. That's the highest estimate, 20,000. Of course, the bulk of them from Middle Eastern and Arab and, and, and Pakistan and, and India, and a handful, yes, from America and from Europe, Europe as well, a few hundred, uh, maybe even up to 1,000 from all European countries combined. So 20,000, roughly, Muslims have responded to the call of of this global caliph. Let's put that into perspective. What is 20,000 compared to 1.6 billion? It is 0.00125% of the Muslim world. To claim that ISIS is Islamic is to claim that 0.001% of a group somehow symbolize the entire group. To put that into perspective, let's look at the KKK in America. At the height of its popularity, which is less than 100 years ago, the KKK had a paid membership of around 4 million people. This is in the 1920s. 4 million people were members of the KKK. And everybody is aware the KKK views itself as being a very Christian organization. If you ever come across their pamphlets or their brochures of the time, they have Christian motifs, Christian symbols, verses from the Bible. They view themselves as being legitimate, bona fide uh, Christians. So, in 1920, the KKK had a membership roughly of 4 million uh, people. And America had a population of around 105 million, which would make the KKK around 3.8% of America's population. Now, how would any one of us feel if somebody said, oh, America was basically KKK in the 1920s? How false would that be? Well, that claim, mathematically speaking, would be 3,500 times more accurate 
mathematically speaking. I just put it into a mathematical equation for you. That claim would be 3,500 times more accurate than the claim somehow that ISIS is reflective of the entire body of Muslims. Nonetheless, from my perspective, 20,000 even is way too much. And I am very distressed, very angry, very scared as an American cleric when I hear that even a handful of American teenagers are contemplating or attempting to join this group. And I am working uh, very much with law enforcement and also within communities to make sure that zero people are sympathetic to ISIS. Not even five, not even 10. We want zero people. But let's keep things in perspective. American Muslims, we don't have exact statistics, but roughly, I would say a moderate figure would be around seven to nine million Muslims in America. Seven to nine million. If out of those seven and nine, seven to nine million, roughly 30, 40, 50 have shown genuine sympathy to, and gone over, let's put things in perspe into perspective. Sure, it's a problem. Sure, we don't even want those 20, 30, but it is not an endemic. It's not something that the entire you know, Muslim population is somehow, uh, uh, somehow complicit in. So, the fact of the matter is that mainstream Muslims the world over have continuously rejected ISIS and its interpretation of Islam. In fact, dare I say, and I have challenged both Graham Wood and actually many other uh, speakers on live radio and, and on, in lectures, I have challenged them to quote me one reputable cleric, one scholar who had established his scholarly credentials and then joined ISIS or somehow sanction ISIS from anywhere in the Muslim world. ISIS and these versions of radical Islam, including Al-Qaeda by the way, they don't have a single bona fide trained cleric of Islam. The only people that they have are their own youngsters that are justifying what they're doing. Never in the history of these movements have we had a reputable scholarly person. I mean, imagine if you would, imagine in an uh, analogical equivalent, imagine uh, a doctor, uh, or not a doctor, excuse me, uh, let's say neurosurgery, let's say, right? You have a certain established practice, you have famous neurosurgeons, you have a methodology. Imagine a new budding medical student, just fresh graduated, challenging the entire understanding of neurosurgery, saying all of you guys are wrong, and writing pamphlets and, and, and books and whatnot. Who would give this person any weight? This person doesn't have the scholarly backgrounds or the skills. This person has no credibility. This is exactly what is happening with ISIS, is that the established figures of Sunni and Shiite and all other versions of Islam, and there are many trends in Sunni Islam, none of them who have established their credibility have then signed on to join this organization, much less sanctioned or justified what this group is doing. So the fact of the matter is Muslims have and continue Continue to dissociate from uh, this radical organization and its understanding of Islam. But this leads me to my second part of the talk, and this is where it gets a little bit difficult or awkward, but nonetheless, these facts do need to be said. The context. Why? Why is this happening, especially in Iraq? What is going on in this region that can explain the rise of this radical, this, this militant uh, organization? And what really is painful to note, and everybody here who has studied Middle Eastern history or is an Arab can tell you this firsthand, and you can find lots of videos online about this as well. Iraq, this country, was one of the shining pinnacles of modern Arab lands. In the 60s and 70s, up until the 80s, Iraq was one of the most, in fact, some would even say the most developed and advanced country in the Middle East. It had amongst the highest literacy rates, even amongst females. In the 70s, the female literacy rate reached in the high 80%. That is phenomenal for the Middle East. In, uh, in the 80s and 90s, the University of, not the 90s, excuse me, not the 90s, in the 70s and 80s, the University of Baghdad, which is one of the largest universities in the Arab world, was considered to be the most prestigious university in the entire Middle East. The number of students, the graduates, the, the, the quality of education was easily comparable to any Western institution. Its healthcare as well was 
the product of much envy in other Arab countries. And frankly, the Iraq of today can barely be recognized as having anything to do with the Iraq of yesteryears. So what has happened from the 70s to 2015? Well, no doubt the first sign of decline began with the almost decade-long war between Iraq and Iran. And for those of you that are above the age of 35, you all remember this. The 80s were always dominated by Iraq and Iran uh, war. And this war, of course, was the beginning, really. It decimated uh, so much of the economy. Millions of people uh, died. And of course, back then, uh, of course, Saddam has been in power since the 70s. Back then, Saddam Hussein was our close ally. And we sold him plenty of weapons. And for at the time, we completely ignored uh, mass human rights violations. We couldn't care less that he was gassing his own people. He was using chemical weapons against his own uh, people. The Kurdish population had their grievances and they wanted to uh, revolt and, and, and bring attention to their plight. And he gassed uh, thousands of them. And we ourselves sold plenty of weapons uh, to uh, Iraq. Of course, turns out later with the Iran Contra scandal that we were also selling weapons to Iran. But then that's just a footnote that's going to be relegated in the larger uh, scale of things. Iraq eventually invaded Kuwait in 1990. All of you remember this. And we led an international coalition that freed this small and oil-rich Gulf state. And 1990-91 was when we launched Gulf War One, And we invaded Iraq, but it wasn't a full-fledged invasion. We didn't really send ground troops to, to be stationed in Iraq. Nonetheless, Gulf War One clearly did decimate uh, the power plants, the electricity uh, uh, plants of, 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 of the region. And it is estimated more than 100,000 Iraqis uh, lost their lives. As a retaliation for Saddam's invasion, we then subjugated Iraq to a almost total financial trade embargo for the next 13 years. Beginning in 1990 and lasting in effect until Gulf War II, which is 2003, 13 years, we basically blanketed, we basically cut off the entire population of Iraq from any type of economic uh, trade. And there are so many statistics that can be said, but again, time is limited. The average per capita income of an Iraqi in 1989, the year before our invasion, was $3,510, which is a good amount for 1989 for a Middle Eastern country. $3,510. Fast forward five years, and that income becomes $450. Imagine if your income were cut, not in half, not in one-third, one-tenth. Instead of getting 70, 80,000, you were getting $7,000 a year. Worse, by limiting the importation of common vaccines, of drugs, even of water purification resources, the United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF, itself estimated that at least half a million children under the age of five died as a result of this embargo. And so much can be said. I just want to point out one undeniable fact. Not one, not two, three top-level United Nations diplomats resigned in protest, one after the other, because of what was happening in Iraq at the time. Beginning with Dennis Halliday, an Irishman with over 34 years as a career diplomat in the United Nations. He was placed in charge of the humanitarian coordination uh, uh, of Iraq in the embargo. And within a year, he tried to protest, he tried to change. Within a year, he resigned from the UN after 35 years. And he wrote in a widely publicized op-ed, you can find all of this online, that he was driven to resignation, and I quote, because I refuse to continue to take Security Council orders, the same council that had imposed and sustained genocidal sanctions against the innocents of Iraq. I did not want to be complicit. My conscience would not allow this, end quote. Okay? So Dennis Halliday said, in effect, we are provoking or causing a genocide. The 
those were the terms he's using and a person who has nothing to do with the Islamic faith, he's not an Arab, he is a UN career diplomat. He resigns. Okay, we put in charge another UN career diplomat. This is a German by the name of Hans von Sponick. Within a year and a half, von Sponick, another 30 plus year of the uh, 30 plus uh, uh, work tenure at the UN also resigns, claiming that these policies, quote unquote, violate the Geneva Convention, which is how you treat human beings decently and dignity. That these policies were violating the Geneva Conventions and were causing the deaths of tens of thousands of Iraqis. Shortly after that, a third diplomat who was in charge of the World Health Organization stationed in Iraq also resigned, citing her protests as a result of these policies. We don't know how many other resignations might have followed had not another tragedy enveloped us, and that is the tragedy of September 11th. This tragedy, of course, was a turning point in many of our uh, our own policies, our own understandings. Um, again, much can be said, but for, for, for the purposes of this lecture, let's concentrate on what happened in Iraq. Obviously, we all know after 9-11, the tragedy of 9-11 was intentionally misused to make a completely false and counterfeit claim somehow linking Iraq with September 11th and Al-Qaeda. The evidence at the time was completely specious, and frankly, even even now, we're just beginning to realize how intentionally misleading certain members of our own government were. A congressional hearing that took place in 2004, documents, this is all online, this is for our own Congress, this is not another entity. Our own congressional hearing that attempted to figure out what's going on documented over 275 instances of what they called blatant misinformation, which is a nice word for basically lying and misleading uh, people. The former U.S. Secretary of State, Colin Powell himself apologized publicly, as we are all aware, and he said that these claims that he made in front of the UN will, and I quote, forever be a blot on my record. He felt bad, he felt guilty, he basically apologized. Well, apologies are nice, even if they're just from one person in that administration, but it doesn't change the fact that after 13 years of sanction, after millions of deaths, we then decided to invade Iraq yet again. But this invasion was was different. This invasion wasn't just a nice clean throwing bombs as we had done in the first Gulf War. It wasn't just putting sanctions. It was also sending in our troops. And the effects of this Gulf War II on the economy of Iraq, on our own troops, on our own economy, including, uh, by the way, the troops, by the way, the PTSD as well, and all of the issues, uh, you know, the post-traumatic uh, stress that, that is undergoing. The, the effects of this invasion on our image and our prestige in the Middle East, all of these are for other topics. I don't have time for all of this in one lecture. Let me just quote you one statistic that came out last week. And this statistic involves how many innocent Iraqi lives were lost as a result of our own invasion. The most thorough study ever done of the casualties of Gulf War II were just released last week a non-government affiliated, non-partisan NGO called Physicians for Social Responsibility. And again, these are all American institutions. They teamed up with a Nobel Prize winning International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, the IPPNW, a very famous Nobel Prize winning institution. And they examined in detail the toll that the war on terror has had for, on the Iraqi people. The investigators concluded after a number of years on on the ground research that the total number of casualties that can directly be attributed to our wars over the last 12 years is around 1.3 million people. 1.3 million people, and then they add, and I quote directly, and I read the report or portions of it today, and this is only a conservative estimate, and that in all likelihood, it's probably around and closer to 2 million. Now, I've quite literally just quoted you three or four statistics and a handful of events that have occurred in Iraq for the last two and a half decades. Much more could be said and should be studied and read on one's own. My point in bringing all of this is very simple. Is it not relevant? 
in understanding the rise of these radical messianic groups to look at what exactly has happened in that region for the last 25 years? Might not some of this somehow explain why and how such groups do seem to be gaining some popularity? Why the people of that region seem to have, frankly, an insane psychotic rage against us? Might it not somehow explain? Now, I want to be as explicit as possible. This is not an attempt to sugarcoat or justify or exonerate terrorism. Not at all. However, let me give you an analogous example. And this is a controversial one, but it needs to be said. Here in America, here in America, there is, of course, we are a melting pot, and there are many cultures here. And there is a dominant culture of one ethnicity and background. Perhaps 60% of America is of one uh, ethnicity. And another ethnicity, another subculture, the African Americans are around roughly 13 to 15%. Now, while the percentage of African Americans in the broader population might be only less than 15, we are all aware that when it comes to prisons, they're not 15% of our prisons. When it comes to the rates of violent crime, when it comes to drug prosecution, when it comes to petty theft, when it comes to gangs, then this minority becomes an overwhelming majority. So, there are two paradigms to explain this. Sadly, both of them are still around. The first paradigm, which was very popular a hundred years ago, sadly it's still popular in some circles today, the first paradigm is to say, oh, that's because they are like this. That's because their culture. That's because their values. That's because, well, even rap songs have been blamed as well, right? They listen to rap, so they're going to become violent people. And it's so easy to fall into this us versus them. We're so holy, they're so barbaric, it's, it's because of who they are, their upbringing, their family. Now, that was very popular 100 years ago. But over the last hundred years, most of us, sadly some haven't got the memo, but most of us are educated enough to realize that the color of your skin will not dictate your propensity to committing crimes. Most of us have realized that all human beings literally are created equal, but then circumstances beyond the color of their skin, circumstances like education, like poverty, like socioeconomic status, like lack of jobs, like racism, affect certain communities more than others. Circumstances like one's own history and where you're coming from, what has happened to you and your culture and civilization for the last two, three hundred years might possibly explain beyond just the color of your skin. And of course, this is now the predominant, thank God, understanding and interpretation that the fact of the matter is that there's nothing in your melatonin that will dictate whether you're going to go into violent crime or not. However, poverty, lack of education, having schools that are so disparate, and again, let me be frank here, we are in one of the cities that this is most clearly demonstrably visible. Certain neighborhoods and their schools and their lack of education and the lack of resources versus neighborhoods across the street. So, this doesn't justify the drug dealers, the violent crimes, the, the whatever, it doesn't doesn't justify the people who are involved in drugs they're still going to go to jail this is not sympathizing this is contextualizing this is making one understand and it's very awkward because when we do this we realize hold on a sec maybe us as a dominant culture have done something to kind of sort of ameliorate or or, or, or or make it easier for another culture to to find avenues in ways that our own children are not going to find those avenues maybe our own history of slavery of Jim Crow laws of segregation, of depriving people of the rights that we had. Maybe that somewhat, maybe somewhat explains what's going on. So what I'm asking you to do is to take that narrative and then also apply it to Islamic radical movements. And that's where it really requires courage. Because you need to look at the mirror and ask yourselves, it's so easy to criticize others and there's a legitimacy. As I said, nobody is exonerating a, a, a drug dealer or a jihadist. In the end of the day, the guy who pulls the trigger, whether he's a drug dealer, whether he's a jihadist, that's the one who's guilty. But as a society, we need to take a step back and ask ourselves, Ourselves. What has caused this young man to be so frustrated that he doesn't find any other avenue other than violent crime or other than thinking that G 
jihad is going to bring about some type of solution. And that is where we really do need to take a step back and understand what have we done in that region for the last 35 years to take Iraq from such a beautiful, magnificent, grand country, the jewel of the Arab world, and now it is on the brink of civil war. No, it is in civil war, not on the brink. It is in civil war. It is one of the most unhospitable places that one of us would want to go. How has this happened? When we look at that, the fact of the matter, not all, but a lot of the responsibility falls on our shoulders and that's why it is awkward and difficult to do so so the question is therefore what needs to be done what can be done I'm an American and I'm a Muslim cleric and I have a very unsavory job on the one hand as a Muslim cleric as a theologian as a jurist I do have to point out to my fellow Muslims from around the world and I do this all the time online and whatnot that this understanding of radical Islam of jihad is un-Islamic. It is counterproductive. It goes against the teachings of my faith. And I always deal with these people online. Online, contrary to popular opinion, radicals are not congregating in your local mosques. No, quite the contrary. We wish they would actually come to mosques so we can uh, deal with them one-on-one, -on -one, talk with them. We wish they would come out publicly so we can actually engage with them. People who are sympathetic to ISIS don't come to the mosques. They're active online. They find internet chat rooms. They're the ones that c congregate in places that they feel so much uh, superior because 5, 10, 20 people from around the globe are going to be in some type of small chat room and they're all sharing the same vision of Islam. My job, yes, as a cleric, is to reach out to them somehow and to convince them that joining ISIS or, 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 or immigrating to these lands is not going to help. Recently in Chicago, three young teenagers were caught in attempting to flee over to ISIS. 16, 17, and 19 years old. That's terrifying. The 17-year-old was a lady, young lady, not even finished high school. I'm a parent of teenagers. I'm terrified when I read that. Three young, middle-class, suburban, American, born and raised teenagers. Their parents had no idea what was going on. Rolling Stones magazine has a really good article. I encourage you to read that in this latest cover uh, story right now, uh, the, the latest magazine. I'm interviewed in that as well. And you'll find my name in there as well. And they interviewed the family. And they interviewed one of these uh, uh, children. The 17-year-old was allowed to speak a little bit. Look at their viewpoint. Look at their, their understanding. Quite literally, I know it sounds unbelievable, they literally believe that by joining ISIS, they are defending innocence. Now this is their world view. I'm not, of course, agreeing with that. That's, my, of course, that's why I'm against them. From their perspective, they're viewing this as ISIS is the group that is fighting for the rights of local people practicing Muslims, Sunni Muslims, when all these invasions are going on. When we supported the, well, not now, but we used to support the Shiite regime of uh, Alawi Maliki, uh, Nuri, Ala, uh, Alawi, um, Nuri, Nuri Maliki uh, last year and before that. And in that time, there was a lot of civil war and strife, Sunnis and Shiites basically going to war. And by and large, the Shiites had some preference. So the Sunnis felt you know, neglected or, 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 or sidelined. So ISIS came out of these political circumstances. These young men and women are naive, they're romantic, they're utopic, but in essence they think that they're freedom fighters. And of course they're wrong, but what I'm trying to impress upon you, they don't think they're going becoming terrorists. They think that they're helping against foreign invasions, helping to repel despotic regimes that by and large we have supported in the region, helping to establish a free and independent. Now, of course they're wrong, again, I keep on making this disclaimer. But if you were to interview one of them, and this lady, the journalist of Rolling Stones did that, their perspective is not one, I'm joining a terrorist movement. Because as we all know, the adage, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. From the perspective of these naive kids, they are defending the freedom of the local people from aggression. And primarily, whose aggression? Our aggression. So here's the point. In order to stop that type of understanding, we, have a two, we need a two-pronged assault, if you like. The first is ideological. 
and that is within the faith. That's my job and the job of my fl fellow clerics. We need to take on ISIS's ideology. We're doing that. And I think we're doing it somewhat effectively. I would like to say that I believe my own efforts have achieved some level of success because recently ISIS itself uh, had a nice cover photo of me in their magazine. They actually have a magazine. And they have a nice picture of me, right smack dab in the middle of the magazine. And I made it to their magazine. Unfortunately, there was a small line at the bottom of it which was a little bit troubling. They were calling for my assassination. But apart from that, the fact of the matter is that Muslims around the world are refuting ISIS and we need to continue to do that. But there must be another pronged attempt as well. And that is, and this I say as an American and not as a Muslim cleric, and that is as an American to my fellow citizens, even as we criticize the brutality of ISIS, even as we are scared at the rise of radical Islam, I say Islam itself does not lead to radicalization. It does not lead to terrorism. Rather, we as a nation need to take a step back and begin a frank and open dialogue about the ethical values values of our own foreign policy, about the repercussions of supporting despotic regimes, about what's going to happen when we bomb and then bomb and then bomb and then bomb again, when 1.3 million people are killed, and before that another million, and before that another few hundred thousand, when the civil society and stability of one of the greatest civilizations that we used to have, the Abbasid Caliphate 700 years ago, and then the modern country of Iraq, when that is completely decimated, what is going to happen? The people that are part of ISIS, you know what truly terrifies me? The people that are a part of ISIS were all general human beings going about their daily affairs, accountants, engineers, lawyers, what not. What has happened to these average people in the last 20 years that they've become so vicious we don't even recognize traces of humanity in them? What has happened? This is not to exonerate them. This is not to lift the blame from them. But, frank question, what would happen in a land that we love, in a land that we appreciate, if similar circumstances were to be superimposed on us for 20, 30 years? Lawlessness, chaos, bombings, lack of job, lack of opportunity, the destruction of civil society. Maybe messianic movements would emerge. Maybe cults would become popular. And those movements and cults would attract large groups of disenfranchised, angry people. When a person's lost a father, had a sister raped, a cousin killed, another they're killed in a drone attack, maybe they're going to start viewing the world in ways that we don't agree with. We're not justifying, but perhaps psychologically we can understand. And this requires a very difficult dialogue. What are the effects of our own foreign policy? What are the effects of supporting regimes, dictatorships, apartheid governments, governments that subjugate masses of innocent people, and we keep on vetoing resolutions that condemn them, keep on selling military uh, 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 equipment to them, keep on giving them aid and turning the other cheek, and the entire Muslim world is aghast at this type of support, you are going to get some repercussions. This is not justifying. This is simply pointing out the obvious, that when there are political grievances, then people who are religious will respond to those political grievances using the language of a faith they believe in. The language will be Islamic, but what is motivating the people is not Islam. What is motivating the people is not the text of the Quran. It is anger that goes back to issues all of us can at some level sympathize with. So, to answer the question, how then does one fight uh, against ISIS and radical Islam? As I said, there are many ways and means. We all have our job to do. I, as a cleric, have to keep on stressing the realities of mainstream orthodox understandings of Islam. And all of us Americans as well need to understand that bringing about peace in that region will actually be the ultimate mechanism to keep radicals from uh, becoming popular. And peace will not be achieved by more bombs, more invasions, more drones. No, peace is not going to be achieved that way. We invaded Al-Qaeda, we invaded Iraq on the pretext of Al-Qaeda. And we never imagined, I never imagined, that a group more radical than Al-Qaeda would emerge. What has happened in the last 13 years?
years. We invaded thinking, we'd eliminate Al-Qaeda. Well, we kind of did, but we created a new Frankenstein, even worse than Al-Qaeda. If we're gonna follow the same tactic again, if we're gonna invade yet again, throw bombs yet again, a bomb is not a nice, precise instrument of destruction. It is a weapon of mass destruction. And when you bomb a civilization for every alleged terrorist you kill, you will kill on average more than a thousand innocent people. 1.3 million might be a statistic to me and you. For the average Iraqi, it translates as a father, a mother, an uncle, a cousin, a son, a daughter. These are legitimate grievances that they have. And when ISIS gives them this illusion that they're standing up to fight against the, the tyrant, then ISIS becomes the David against the mighty Goliath. No matter how, how unreal that is, that is what explains the rise of these radical Islamic movements. So we have a lot of work to do ahead of us. And perhaps we might disagree, Muslims, Christians, atheists, Jews, agnostics of America, we might disagree on many moral issues, many ethical issues, but when it comes to fighting radicalism of all types, Islamic or others, then I think we should all be on the same page. And instead of spading, spreading hatred and fear and xenophobia and bigotry, we need to learn to work together. We need to understand that all human beings, in the end of the day, are human. Muslims, Christians, Jews, it doesn't matter. In the end of the day, what radicalizes people are not ancient texts. It's not being able to provide for your family and children. It's having circumstances that lead to this type of anger. And therefore, to solve this problem, we need that dialogue at least to begin. And we need to learn to cooperate together, even if we don't agree about each and every theological principle or legal ruling. I think we can all agree we want to make this world a safer place for ourselves and our children. Let's work to do that by listening to each other by understanding that we have much more in common than we have not in common. We have much more to work together rather than to create fear with each other. And I conclude this talk by asking God himself to bring about peace in this world between people of all faiths. I am a believing Muslim. There are people who are believing Christians and believing Christian and, and Jews in this audience and people of other faiths. The one thing that we can all agree on, no religion encourages wanton violence and bloodshed. Every religion, every religion in the face of the world wants peace, not just for its people, but for all of humanity. Let people of all faiths and people of no faiths come together and work together for this ideal. Thank you very much for listening and may God's peace be upon you. So the question is, what is your view of Wahhabism and uh, is Wahhabism connected to the ideology of ISIS? Uh, Wahhabism is a strand of Sunni Islam. Uh, Sunni Islam is the dominant uh, interpretation of Islam. Around 80 to 85 percent of Muslims are Sunni and around around 15 or less than 15 because there's like 1 percent that are miscellaneous, neither Sunni nor Shiite. Sunnis and Shiites together make 99 percent of the Muslim world. So uh, Sunnism with 85 percent of the Muslim world obviously obviously has strands within it, right? Similar to, let's say, Protestant Christianity, there are many interpretations of Protestant Christianity. And Wahhabism is one particular uh, strand or interpretation uh, which is predominant in the country of Saudi Arabia and in Qatar, and recently it has become very popular across the uh, globe. Uh, to give you one example, in Egypt, when there was a free and fair election four and a half years ago, for the first time in over 100 years, when, when Egypt had its first democratic election, the Muslim Brotherhood won the majority of the votes, 25% of the votes went to Wahhabist or it's also called Salafist parties, which really demonstrates that they are not an insignificant minority. Now, much has been said about uh, Wahhabism or, or Salafism and the fact that it has linkages to ISIS or Al-Qaeda. And uh, in my estimation, this is an oversimplification to the point of almost being incorrect. Uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, these movements, Al-Qaeda and others, they have emerged from a merging of multiple strands of Islam, multiple strands of, of, of Islam, and mainly they owe their uh, they owe their their genesis to radical breakaway movements of the Muslim Brotherhood that date back to the 70s. All of you that are uh, uh, that were uh, adults in the 1980s, 1981, you all remember the assassination of Anwar Sadat. You all remember Anwar Sadat. Anwar Sadat was assassinated by a very radical organization that was a breakaway from the Muslim Brotherhood. 
The Muslim Brotherhood, by and large, has not resorted to terrorist activities. This organization felt we need to expedite. They broke away and they succeeded in assassinating Sadat. Well, Ayman al-Zawahiri, who is now the current CEO of Al-Qaeda, uh, the chief of Al-Qaeda, was actually a minor card-carrying member of this organization. This organization that assassinated Sadat. So he was actually jailed for being a member. He wasn't involved in the plot, he was a member. So yes, Salafism or Wahhabism has some effect on, this, on these movements. Uh, and you have certain theological tendencies that, that, are, de that are demonstrated. So for example, uh, Salafism uh, or Wahhabism does not endorse uh, religious icons or statues. Uh, pause here. So Protestants and Catholics, very similar understanding that if you go to a Protestant church or a Catholic church, in a Protestant church you're not going to find figurines, statues of Mary or whatnot. Nor will you find prayer being directed to saints, whereas in a Catholic church it might be more common. And Martin Luther and, and the entire Protestant movement, for example, uh, strongly discouraged, in fact, considered it blasphemy, considered it a stepping stone to idolatry, to pray to these figurines and, and, and to invoke. So Salafism is a type of Protestant Islam. And that is why Salafism does not like icons, which is why certain movements such as Al-Qaeda and ISIS like to destroy religious icons that are figurines as they try to destroy the statues and whatnot. Okay, so that is Salafism. But the militancy or the jihadism or the radicalization, that is not coming from Salafism. Most Wahhabis, I'm using the term interchangeably, there's a minor difference, we're not going to get into this. Most Wahhabis are very apolitical, very pacifist. Most Wahhabis, you can consider them to be somewhat like maybe the Amish or the ultra-Orthodox Jews where they're always incessantly thinking about what clothes they're wearing, the purity of their food, uh, uh, you know, just living very pietistic lives. And they believe that getting involved in politics is corruptive to the soul. They want to live pure lives. So most Wahhabis are very, very apolitical. So rather than viewing them as somehow being a threat or a danger, the fact of the matter is that they're some of the most innocent, innocuous movements when it comes to living in broader society. They might have views that are that are unpalatable, no doubt about that. They view, you know, their views of, of, of integration or of women. Yeah, that's, they have their own, but I don't view them very different than ultra-Orthodox Jews, for example, in how they view. They want to live their own lives. So I don't view ISIS as being directly caused by the theology of, uh, of Wahhabism. Um, what would you advise uh, American foreign policy and how to change uh, its, its um, outlook. I'm not a politician. Thank God I'm not a politician. I'm not a politician, so I really don't have uh, concrete you know, uh, things to say. But my gut instinct would be, number one, let's find alternative energy sources than oil. Because the fact of the matter is that we are involved in freeing Kuwait and being involved in the region primarily because of oil, let's be honest here, right? And again, I say as an American, I say this as an American, that I am very worried about the strong ties that exist between members of our government and between oil companies. This is something that is highly problematic. And I think that we need to be talking about this as Americans, much more than talking about radical Islam and the Holy Quran and whatnot. That this is something that is affecting us. And we really need to ask ourselves how much of our foreign policy is in fact uh, related to uh, perhaps personal interests. That's something that is a very difficult conversation. That's my first point, that find alternative means of energy. We have plenty of natural resources. Instead of oil, you know, the wind or the, you know, the, the, the air and the, the, the sun, solar, all of these are very great ways to, 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 to make energy. And the second thing I would say is that I, I believe that we as a nation need to look at the philosophy of our founding fathers and that from most of our history, the 17, 1800s, America was actually a very isolationist country because they realized and they knew that getting involved in other affairs and other lands and other people is going to have a repercussion. And if you look at our history, for most of our history, this was our philosophy. We we had to be begged almost to enter World War I. We did not want to enter World War I, but we saw there was a greater need. But unfortunately for the last hundred years or so, I believe, again this is my interpretation, we've kind of veered away and we've, we've 
We've positioned ourselves to be the one and only superpower. It's as if our interests have to be taken care of everywhere in the world. And I think this hegemonic, uh, uh, this hegemonic uh, attitude that we have of being this, this uh, massive uh, entity that's going to solve all the world's problems is going to also bring many of the world's problems to us as well. Mind our own business and people are going to mind their own business. That's also one thing that I would recommend. Uh, so, we have a, a person saying that, can you give us uh, examples of definitions of terrorists? For example, this German pilot just killed hundreds of people, and if he was a Muslim, he would have been called a terrorist. Can you comment on the media's uh, uh, standards? So, um, I think one of the things that if any uh, person speaks to a Muslim in the audience and you talk about you know, what, what are they irritated about, I think number one on the list would be media portrayals. How the media just jumps on uh, an event that a Muslim might have done and then really makes a big issue out of it. And then when other groups or other organizations do it, it's kind of not really mentioned. So let me ask you an honest question. How many of you are aware that last week, a person in Atlanta, which is around the corner, attempted to place a bomb in a park. And it was just a coincidence, or I would say, of course, as a religious person, God willed, he get caught in doing that. How many of you have been aware that there was a pipe bomb planted in a public park? Seven, eight hands. You know the person who planted it? He described himself as a patriot. And he had a copy of the Quran in the bomb or in the materials. And when he was caught, he confessed that he wanted people to realize the threat of radical Islam. So he wanted to plant a false bomb in the name of Islam, pretending a Muslim had done it, thinking that this is going to bring the attention of the people to the threat of radical Islam. Who's the real threat then? Who's the real threat, right? The FBI itself on their webpage has said that the number one terrorist threat of America is not Islamic groups, it's the far right. This is not me speaking. Go onto their website and look at it. The number one threat that we're facing internally, domestically, is not Al-Qaeda or whatnot. It is in fact the far right groups that are, their rhetoric and their whatnot is a bit frightening for someone like me. I have gotten more death threats in America from the far right than I have ever got. I haven't got a single death threat from within America other than from the far right. No ISIS, no, no Al-Qaeda, nothing. ISIS has threatened me 5,000 miles away. And I was asked, I was interviewed on CNN and, and Fox News, I was asked, you know, aren't you worried and scared to go to the mosque or a conference, Islamic conference? And my response was, the safest place for me in America is a mosque or an Islamic conference. I have no fear that American Muslims are sympathetic to ISIS or whatnot. But you know where I genuinely felt threatened? I'm sorry to say this, on the streets of Memphis, multiple times, people have said things to me, to my wife, to my children. Last year, some driver literally drove quickly my wife and kids were on the road just drove by and you know it's just very I have been told to my face go back where you came from you don't effing belong here and that is what terrifies me somebody just literally came up to me and bumped into me in the market in the uh, you know in the um, uh, shopping mall just like you know bumps in and just mutters and walks on that's what terrifies me yes. And we have to be honest about this as well. We have a problem of Islamophobia, where we're fomenting this hatred, this fear. We have a problem of people thinking that every Muslim is somehow a terrorist supporter or sympathizer. And I will tell you as a national American cleric who is well known and tra travels everywhere, I have no fear of American Muslims. My fear, frankly, more is from the far right than it is from American Muslims. Now, of course, honestly, if I were in Iraq, I wouldn't fear the far right. I'd fear ISIS, okay? But I'm not in Iraq, I'm here. So that's the point over there. Um, the US arms industry makes large political contributions. Do you think these tend to promote military solutions? Um, again, I'm not a politician. However, I do recommend that you uh, Google this, uh, or it's on YouTube, uh, Eisenhower's last speech in the White House on YouTube. 
Eisenhower's, President Eisenhower's last speech in the White House. The very last speech that he gave, I think it was 1959 or something, the very last speech that he gave, he warned about the increasing uh, cooperation between military uh, facilities and between arms manufacturing companies and how much these are influencing our government. I mean, frankly, you know, when our vice presidents become vice presidents of Halliburton or whatnot, frankly, we really do have to start scratching our heads and wondering what is going on, okay? Uh, do you, what, do you, would you like to comment, or what are your comments on the Saudi-led Arab coalition against Yemen? Uh, and do you think this has resulted in another ISIS-like group? So I commented on this uh, yesterday on Facebook that this is a complex situation. Uh, ISIS, I don't think will directly uh, benefit, but it's a difficult situation because again, you have a war going on between two equally corrupt parties. Each one is fighting for its own self-interest, and the sad reality is they drag in sectarian conflict into it. I want to surprise you when I say Sunnis and Shiites, for most of Islam's history, they might not have been brothers and singing Kumbaya, but they didn't kill each other. They didn't massacre each other. This is a relatively modern, last 50 years phenomenon. Relatively modern. Ask anybody who's an Arab or a Pakistani Indian who's older than 50, 60 years. This wasn't something that was known. But what's happened is politics has been dragged into theological differences. Right now, as we have these two countries basically at war, once again, Sunni, Shi Sunnism and Shiism is being used. Whereas the people that are using them are not very practicing or believing or religious minded. Each one is interested in his own political uh, and economic interests. And therefore, you know, I mean, uh, as I said, I thank God I'm not a politician. As a religious person, I have to say, I kind of, and I think many non religious people will sympathize with me, we don't view politicians in a very positive light. <laughs> In that, by and large, many of them are more interested in themselves and their own agenda than in their actual people. And this is a general rule. Muslim, non-Muslim, doesn't matter. It's just that's the way people are. When you get to that place, it kind of, you are more interested in yourself than in the people around you. And this is what's happening. Yemen and Saudi Arabia are now at each other's, you know, uh, well, I mean, not Yemen, the Houthis of Yemen, which is, which is a Shiite community. They have been repressed. They have been uh, uh, not given equal opportunities by the government for four decades. So now they've rebelled. They've rebelled and they happen to be of a different sect. So the president has called upon, the deposed president has called upon Saudi Arabia, Cohen invade his own country. Sadly, who's going to suffer the most? The innocent people of both sides, Sunni and Shiite, that have nothing to do with this conflict. The people on whose heads bombs are being dropped. And when those bombs are dropped, don't be surprised when they start believing sectarian rhetoric. Oh, the Shiites did this. Oh, the Sunnis did this. That might actually happen. And I'm just very distressed and sad. I, I'm not a Gandhi in that I don't believe that peace is always the answer. Sometimes you have to go to war. We had to go to war in World War II. You had to stop Hitler. But I do believe that generally speaking, war creates more problems than it solves. And therefore, I'm very pessimistic about the whole issue of bombing people, and I am opposed to what's happening in uh, the bombing of Yemen as well. Um, besides ideological engagement, what else can we do to bring peace and save innocent people from such radical groups? So each one of us needs to find our own forte, our own passion. For some of us, that might be journalism. For, for some of us, that might be just community activism. For some of us, that might be counseling. For others, myself, such as my Self is basically Islamic theology. Uh, whatever it is, there are many, many ways to combat radicalism. The anger that these young men and women are feeling needs to be tapped into and channeled positively. We need to tell these disenfranchised young men and women that, you know what, it's okay to be angry. It's okay to, to, to be angry. Frankly, it's human to be angry when you see people suffering. But take that anger and channel it in a positive manner. Do something productive for society. Don't go and bomb other people, kill other people, because then you're going to do exactly what you're accusing them of doing, right? The problem comes, and again, I'll be very frank here, one of the things I very strongly disagree with when it comes to counterterrorism 
policy is the, the issue of baiting young men and women, entrapping them, finding somebody online, a 19-year-old kid, typically drop out, not very intelligent usually, romantic, nostalgic, utopic, and then seeing he has some bad rhetoric about America. Then sending in undercover people and goading this person, you know, telling him, yeah, we'll do this, we'll do that. And then all of a sudden launching a sting operation, having a big conference and, you know, the, the chief of police and whatnot comes out and says, oh, we have now, you know, captured a, a, another terrorist. You know, if we were to do this on the war on drugs, targeting the petty drug dealers, or, or coaxing the teenagers to sell drugs, how effective would it be on the war on drugs? Tell me. If we were to go to high school and pretend, oh, we, I have pot, you want to sell it on my behalf? I have crack cocaine, you want to sell it? And try to get young kids to sell. How effective would that be? Rather than being effective, it's a waste of our tax dollars, and more importantly, it angers other young men and women. My friend was set up. He was trapped. And rather than basically engagement and dialogue, these people go more underground. And my message has always been to all law enforcements, work with us. We're on the same side as you. We're on the same side as you. I don't want to see a single kid of my community or any community sympathize with ISIS. If you find one, bring him to me. Let's dialogue. Let me talk to him one-on-one. -on -one. Let me extract his anger and channel it in a useful manner. Because I feel I can do that and I have done that on many occasions. That's what Muslim clerics are for. Let's have an intervention, right? Rather than a setup. Let's have a jihadi intervention, okay? Find somebody like this and then let's bring him and just basically intervene and say, you can't do this anymore. His family, his friends. And you'll always find the people who are sympathetic to these types of ideas are naive, they're utopic, they are young because they have to be young to be naive, right? Generally speaking, they're not that smart because again, it all fits in with that. They're searching for identity. They're struggling to, to make something of themselves and they think that by joining this, they're going to make something of themselves. Let us take these people and rehabilitate them within the community. Make them productive. And I think if we were to do this, we'd be far more effective battling against these uh, ideas. Um, this has all been uh, answered. How do you prevent young people from getting brainwashed? I've spoken quite a lot about this today. I want to add one more point as well. One of the problems that we have is that many of our imams, our preachers, rather than promoting radicalism, they are actually too apolitical. Most of the imams of North America are scared to talk about politics because they have come from repressive countries. They have come from places where if you did talk about politics, you'd disappear and be tortured and maybe even killed. So they come to this foreign land, from their perspective, and they're following the same philosophy. And this is one of the differences between myself and many of the older generation whom I admire and respect, but I was born and raised here. And I feel American. I have no other nationality. I've never had any other passport, right? I feel American fully to the core. And one of the things I pride myself with being American, with my country, is that I have the God-given constitutional right to speak out against anything that I perceive my government as doing as being unjust. This is not against patriotism. It is the essence of patriotism to speak truth to power. It is the essence of being an American that I don't have to toe the party line. I don't have to agree with anything that my president or government says. I have the right to disagree and disagree with passion. And I want my youngsters to know, so do you. You have that right as well. Come out from under the woodworks, from under the internet. Come out and, and and speak your grievances so that we can know and address them. Our problem comes, and we've done this multiple times, it's as if we've criminalized dissent. We've criminalized dissent. Our young men and women, our imams are too scared to speak out. And what happens is they go to the Friday sermon, Friday sermon after Friday sermon, and they never once hear a legitimate anger that is allowed and permissible and ethical and moral that we should not be engaged in killing people. We should not be sending drones. We should not be having false invasions. There's nothing. All it is is stuff that has nothing to do with why he's feeling angry. Be good Muslims, give charity, fast Ramadan. That's great. But once in a while, there's got to be a social change as well. Like we talk about hungry people on the street, better education. We also need to talk about some of the disagreements we have with American policy. 
There's nothing wrong with that. We can't criminalize that. And if our leaders and clerics were to do this, I believe that those people that are sympathetic to these views would be drawn out. We can engage with them. We can dialogue. If you look at any of these young men and women that have gone abroad or attempted to go abroad to ISIS, none of them genuinely engage with community leaders. Top secret planning. These three kids in Chicago, none of their friends knew about it. None of the family members, their local imam had no clue. Their parents woke up one day and the three kids are missing. Not a single hint about what's going to happen. We don't want that. We want them to feel brave enough, American enough, to come out and share their grievances with us. And I think that if we all work together to create a more open and tolerant culture, frankly, a more American culture, right? This would go a long way to help fight radicalization. Ten minutes? Okay, we have ten minutes and then we are closing up for today. Uh, so, is there anything uh, that is inherently in Islam that somehow leads to, to radicalization? You know, that's a very good question. It's a very frank question. And let me tell you, as a believing and practicing Muslim, as a Muslim theologian and cleric, I believe there are certain concepts that can be misused and abused. Yes, I'll be honest with you. Yes, certain ideas that can be misused. Obviously, I don't believe they're being applied properly. But are there ideas in Islam that can somehow generate some type of radicalism that other groups don't have? Frankly, yes, there are. But I don't blame authentic Islam. I blame inauthentic or misunderstanding Islam. Such as what? I'll give you two or three things. Number one, the issue of the Muslims understanding themselves as one political entity. It's called the Ummah, U-M-M-A-H, the Ummah. Muslims are taught, this is a standard part of Islamic teachings, that all Muslims around the world deserve the same love, the same respect, and the same defense as any other. And so, the nation-state paradigm kind of becomes secondary. And fellow Muslims feel a legitimate grievance when they see other Muslims being bombed, other Muslims being killed. Now, many of you who are religious, you will understand this from within your own church paradigm. If somebody from your own church, if somebody from your own community was in pain, you would feel more of a connection than somebody else. That's what it is, right? You just feel more of a connection. So imagine believing that 1.6 billion Muslims are one global community. And therefore, a problem that's happening, let's say, in Palestine, should affect you. I can tell you as a non-Palestinian, a non-Arab, my parents are Indian Pakistani, I didn't grow up speaking Arabic, I have not yet been to Palestine. I can tell you, quite honestly, the Palestinian issue is one that all Muslims around the world hold very near and dear to their hearts. They are very hurt and grieved at what's happening in Palestine. It genuinely affects them. It genuinely causes them to feel the suffering of Palestinians for the, the brutality of what's going on. I'm not Palestinian, but my heart bleeds for them. That's the reality of all Muslims. So when we continue to support a regime that is treating Palestinians in this way, literally inhumanely for the last 50 years, it's going to have its repercussions. So the concept of ummah, right? And then the second point that can be misused and abused. Now the concept of ummah was meant to help everybody. Of course, it could also be misused. The second concept is the concept of jihad. I will not sugarcoat when I tell you the Quran does of course talk about jihad. Jihad from the Islamic perspective is a noble doctrine. It's not terrorism. Jihad is how we would translate it to English as just war theory. There are times you have to go to war. And when you go to war for just causes, that war becomes noble. None of us in this room, hopefully, is going to say that fighting against Hitler was, was not a good thing. We all understand it was a good thing. Going to World War II, we needed to go to World War II. That understanding is the Islamic understanding of jihad. Defending against the innocent, uh, against uh, or for the innocent, on behalf of the innocent people. Fighting aggression. So from the perspective of Al-Qaeda and ISIS, and this is where mainstream Islam disagrees, from the perspective of ISIS and Al-Qaeda, they're engaging a jihad against 
an invading, not just army, an invading nation and country. All Americans become legitimate targets. This is where mainstream Islam disagrees with these movements. That no, innocent civilians, people that have nothing to do, you can't go and kill them. But from their perspective, it's as if you invaded us, you did this, all of you become legitimate targets. So there is this notion of jihad, there is this notion of ummah. If used properly, they lead to noble results, in my opinion, because I'm a Muslim, obviously. If used improperly, if you have a twisted interpretation, they can lead to Al-Qaeda and other such uh, movements. Um, we have a question here. Uh, oh, there's a comment here that there's, we have an archaeologist in the room, uh, so he says that there's archaeological and historical evidence that uh, there was peace and harmony amongst the, the religions uh, of, the, uh, of ancient and medieval Islam. And he mentions, for example, that uh, the first mosque uh, and the first church and the first synagogue of uh, Africa have been found to be in a very similar area or close by region. Al Fustat. Okay, so uh, so basically there's archaeological evidence to indicate that the religions got along very well by and large for most of their history. And that's of course we completely, uh, that was exactly what I said as well. Of the many tactics of terrorist organizations, uh, one effective method that comes to mind and that is creating social and economic outlets for marginalized minorities. Some may give loans, others may give uh, scholarships. Uh, do you think that mosques in Iraq and the Middle East need to step up and become and become the main source of social and econ economic relief in order to cure the community of terrorism. Ideally, yes. Realistically, how can one mosque substitute for a government's role? There is no social order. There is no civil society. There is no government. There is no police force that's going to respond equally to people. There is nothing of this nature. So how can one uh, mosque how can one mosque uh, take the role of an entire civilization and society? Each person and group needs to do what it can, but in the end of the day, what needs to be seen is a fully democratic uh, system of government that is literally for the people, by the people, independent of other people. People need to respect their leaders, and their leaders have to be from within, not installed from without, supported from without, because those governments are not going to be effective. Look at Afghanistan. We installed a regime there. They have zero credibility amongst the broader population. I mean, frankly, let me be honest here. Imagine if China funded one of our own presidential campaigns, and we all knew it, and the president came to power because of just funding, which, you know, is not even like what we did, just funding. How would broader Americans react to this? You tell me. So is it surprising when people or regimes or dictatorships that are fully in power because of us have zero credibility amongst large swaths of the Middle East? Again, the issue comes, how will we attain peace there? We're going to have to let those societies govern themselves. It's not going to be easy. I know this is simplistic to say, but at least to understand why these grievances exist is the beginning uh, uh, to, to solving the problem. Uh, I'll take one more question and then I need to... Uh, um, I need to uh, wrap up because time is, is over. Um, do you believe that Islam is in need of a reformation? A very interesting question. I actually gave a number of talks about this uh, recently in England and, uh, and also at Yale, by the way, when I was there, I also had a whole talk about this. This is a difficult question to answer, and it's almost impossible in three minutes. One of my problems, I'm a university professor. When you ask me these questions, I can't answer in one minute. I can teach a class on Islamic Reformation. One class I taught at Rhodes last year was all about modern Islam and the controversies. You know, uh, I have a class right now I'm teaching at Rhodes, modern Muslim fundamentalism, and I, we teach Al-Qaeda and ISIS, you know, weeks and weeks. So when somebody asks me, what do you do? I say, I'm teaching jihad in Tennessee, because in reality, that's kind of what I am doing. I'm teaching jihad in Tennessee. My most popular course at Rhodes is, is modern Muslim fundamentalism. So you ask this question, is Islam in need of a reformation? And I find it impossible to answer you in three minutes. Nonetheless, very, very quickly. What do you mean by reformation? Do you mean reformation with a capital R? In which case, I would tell you, why do you assume that other civilizations are going to undergo the same path as yours or ours did? The Reformation with the capital R, the Renaissance with the capital R, were European phenomenon that catered to European problems. 
that took place in a very particular social, economic, theological milieu. There were lots of tensions between the Catholic Church and between states. There was a lot of repression, a lot of bloodshed. Science itself was being impeded, as we all know. In order to solve those issues, Europeans needed to invent these understandings. The Renaissance and Reformation were needed. We would not be here today as a Western society were it not for the Renaissance and the Reformation. But let me ask you, what if the problems of medieval and even modern Islam have nothing to do with the problems that Martin Luther faced you know, in 1500 uh, England and Germany and, 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 and uh, Bavaria and where else? What if the problems of modern Islam are totally unique and separate, which they are? Of course they have problems, every society has its problems. Well then why do we need to undertake the same solution that worked 500 years ago for a different place, a different people, a different time. I'm not trying to be idealistic, but Islam never had a problem with modernity and science. And I challenge anybody to actually look this up. Islam never had a problem with embracing new ideas and, and encouraging scientific thought. Frankly, Muslims led the world for three, 400 years when it came to, to science. We never had a problem of separation of church and state, right? Our, our issues were not separation of church and state. We didn't have that type of tension. So why then should the solution be a European one? So if you mean a reformation with a capital R, no. I don't think Islam needs a reformation. But if you mean a reformation as an adjective with a small r, does Islam need some fine tuning, some updating and modernizing? Then yes, definitely, it does. It does, why? Because every system of laws, without exception, even if they're divine, need to just be adapted and fine-tuned to society. Simple example, look at the Constitution. Look at the Constitution. The Constitution, none of us here says it's divine, I hope at least, we all believe it's a man-made document, it's a very noble, good dog, it's not divine. I hope nobody says God revealed it. No, it's a number of very intellectual, deep philosophers came together and basically wrote the Constitution. How has it been interpreted for the last 350 years, 300 years? Very differently, right? When it was written and it said, all men are created equal, well, quite obviously, their interpretation of that phrase, and I don't need to get into examples, was very different than how we are interpreting it now. Correct? So, things evolve. Understandings evolve. The Constitution remains the same, but we're now thinking a lot about how to interpret it in light of modernity. Okay? And that's fine. So, Islam has its own holy scriptures, and we believe they are divine. That is a big difference, obviously. And therefore, certain things are non-negotiables. We will have to believe that. But other things are negotiable. What is negotiable and what is not negotiable, this is the domain of Islamic clerics, of internal theologians, of jurists. Let them organically decide what needs to be reformed and how it's going to be reformed. Slowly but surely change will come. But let me tell you, change cannot be superimposed from a dominant force by bombing people to believe in an ideology. It doesn't work that way. Change has to come organically from within, according to the rules set by the people who follow them, not from without. So, Islam, ideally speaking, will never be Western liberalistic humanism because they're two different traditions. But can Islam peacefully coexist with Western liberalism? I believe yes it can. Of course it can. All you need to do is look at the sheer quantity of conservative, practicing, believing religious Muslims in Europe, in Canada, in Australia, in America. Total number of Muslims in these Western secular liberal democracies is around 40 million. 40 million, actually more than that, 50 million. Around 50 million, if you do France as well, it's just 20 million. 50 million Muslims, by and large, are living in and under liberal democracies. It is possible. Yes, certain compromises are going to have to be made. Yes, we're going to have to agree to disagree. But hey, doesn't America itself, non-Muslim population, agree to disagree? What percentage of America has other views about whatever? Whether it's abortion, whether it's civil rights issues, whether it's uh, um, uh, uh, not civil rights, same sex, not civil rights, sorry, uh, same sex issues. We have a controversy, right? We have dialogue going on, don't we? So if somebody has an alternative viewpoint, 
Does that make them un-American? Does that make them a fifth column? You have to learn to tolerate. And if you agree with the majority, that's great. If not, you're going to have to live your lifestyle so that you can still live with the broader community. So American Muslims are no different. We might have our own viewpoints about certain ethics, certain morality, but does that mean we cannot be productive, useful citizens of a global world? No, it doesn't. And all you need to do is look around you. The sheer quantity of successful Muslim Memphians in this audience, right? Here we have every second Muslim here is a doctor, isn't they? Why are they? Right? 10% of doctors in this country, you know, are, are Muslim background. That's a huge percentage. Not that not being a doctor is not successful. I'm not a doctor, by the way. Right? When my mother, you know how mothers are. When my mother she introduces me and somebody says, Dr. Yasir Qadi, she goes, oh, he's not that type of doctor. He's the academic doctor. So she kind of like, you know, he's not the real doctor. He's like the, the PhD doctor. So yeah, my point is, you can be successful and be an American and be a Muslim. Does that mean you're going to follow the normative interpretation? Maybe Muslims are not going to go, you know, drink and, 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 and you know, uh, do things that are un-Islamic. That doesn't make them any less a part of society. So, Islamic reformation can occur, should occur, but at our pace, according to our philosophy, from within, and not superimposed from without. Uh, thank you all very much for attending, and I will call the uh, moderator to come and continue, inshallah.